it is been known for a long time that the consumption of physical materials to build machines to deliver the same unit of energy if you go wind and solar and batteries averages a thousand percent more than if you do hydrocarbons again it depends on the exact material but roughly that so you have a thousand percent increase on physical material consumption to deliver the same end service to society uh, that has consequences My guest today is Mark Mills. Mark is a physicist and partner in Montrose Lane, an energy tech venture fund, and also the author of several award-winning books. His latest book is The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom in a Roaring 2020s. He outlines the transformative power of the cloud and what technology will bring to humanity in the coming years. I recently sat down with Mark and we talked about how the conventional wisdom on the way technology will change the future is just plain wrong and how a convergence of technologies will drive an economic boom. Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I look forward to it since uh, we spoke a couple of, I think it was last week or so. And, and when I got your book, uh, really great stuff, man. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to... Uh to talk about the book and anything you want to talk about. The Absolutely. book covers a lot of territory. <laughs> yeah, the name of the book, folks, is The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. So you put a lot of stuff in this book. There's a lot of, and I love the fact uh, you, you went to town on reference notes and footnotes, uh, so really, really well-sourced. But before we even begin... There's something that I was reading in one of the reviews. Was it one of the, I'm not sure it was one of the reviews or maybe on somewhere else. And it starts off with the conventional wisdom on how technology will change the future is wrong. And you lay out a radically different and optimistic vision for what's really coming. So first, yeah. Mark, tell me what the conventional wisdom is and tell me how they just missed the boat on this. Yeah, well, that's a fair question. I think uh, in my mind, based on, and all of us read many of the similar things, certainly in the public space, uh, conventional wisdom falls into two buckets. One is, one relates to the nature of growth in the long term. By long term, I don't mean century, but the next couple decades. And that we're in an era of sort of a new normal where growth rates for GDP are sub 2% and absent coming off of a recession when you get hypertrophied brief growth rates. And that's because, in effect, the really radical productivity driving inventions are all behind us. I mean, there's lots of stuff going on, but it's from an economist perspective, and these are economists are typically saying this, it's small ball, right? Impo you know, nice, important, you know, keep getting efficiencies, but nothing equivalent to the invention of electricity or nothing equivalent to the invention of the car is coming. <clears throat> so that's conventional wisdom in that sense. And then for those who are, you know, I would, we'll call it the optimists or the visionary, so-called visionaries, I think there's a lot of change. They tend to think all the changes are typically in um, the infatuation with, quote, green energy, you know, Teslas and windmills. This is where the revolutions are coming. And they're, they're important things, but they're not, not revolutionary in the sense of the long span of history. It just They just aren't. They're, it's incrementally useful, incrementally important, big industries, but not revolution. So that's the conventional wisdom. It tends to fall in those two buckets as well, well, you well, well, read stories. Let me interject for one second. What's a revolutionary technology? Give me an example. Well, so the invention of a car or the transistor was revolutionary. And its real revolution occurred, it's the point I try to make in my book, not when it was invented, but when engineers eventually got to the point, and it takes a while to make a commercially viable version of the invention or the idea. Same would be true for airplanes. Same would be true, by the way, for cell phones or television, whatever product or technology. So... The question would be, are there, is there anything equivalent to that that's been invented and that is approaching commercial viability? I'll pick two examples because that's what you want, but I want to sort of frame what I mean by the example. Uh, the emergence of biocompatible computing is a, is a revolution. If you can make uh, sensors, and computer chips, control systems 
that are biocompatible means they can be implanted or literally ingested or injected. If one can do that, it's a big deal. I mean, we can talk about the applications, but it's a significantly different kind of product than anything that ever existed. It's no longer a theoretical product or an imaginary product. These things are real. They're pre-commercial in the sense there's no big industry around them yet, but it's a product. Another example of a sort of the other end of the spectrum would be something people have talked about, I don't know, for certainly for a better part of a century, but in some senses for centuries, which are truly useful robots, robots that are that can operate with and in the human with humans and in the human environment, not that have to be isolated from people. Uh, that kind of robot, uh, again, we can talk about what the implications of such a machine would be, but that's really different than an automatic washing machine or a, a welding arm in a factory that is bolted to the floor. You know, a walking um, operating ambulatory self-directing robot in the sense that everybody knows what the word really means, even though it's an elastic word. That's a big deal. Those also, as we, as you know, you can find them YouTube's videos of all kinds of uh, what I would call pre-commercial products. And there are a variety of commercial products. So the, the robot industry is roughly at a stage equal to the automotive industry say 10 years after the invention of the automobile, which would be like 1900, 1905. And the biocompatible electronics industry is roughly where the transistor industry was before Intel was uh, formed. Right, 1950s, what the transistor was there. Okay. So just so uh, we're all on the same page, and I just want my listeners to, because you capture, you you throw a lot of information here, which just makes you think (laughs) after each chapter, which is, I love it. And uh, it was really very good stuff. So the semiconductor on its own is a big deal. But yeah. the semiconductor <laughs> embedded in so many different uh, uh, products and technologies, that's the bigger deal. That's the adaptation of the technology, right? So sitting in the ivory tower, you know, we had a uh, classic example, fax machines back in the 1940s. You were able to do it. But the that was a technology. But the adaptation didn't come until... The 80s, late 70s, 80s, yeah. and that's when you see that, really, I think it was the 90s even, went through the 90s. That's when you see that tremendous revolution, if you will, right? That's what we're talking about. So, yeah, so let's talk, if you're, if one is an investor or an analyst or whatever, you know, a futurist, whatever, or business, in business, you want to know what's going to disrupt your industry, to use that overused phrase. There's two points uh, on the sort of development curve that one cares about is when there's a lot of growth from a very low base, that is just when something becomes practical, an awful lot of people get involved making the things. Early days of the automobile, just to go back to history, because gives an easy example. The United States had something like 400 automobile manufacturers for the by first the way, 20 way, or 30. Yeah, I did, I did a count on that. Yeah, it was pretty close, amazing. Close, then they, but from eight, late 1890s to early 19, 10, 20, close to 3,000. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm looking more at the, at the, so you go from thousands of automobile tinkerers and makers to right, right around 1905 to 1925 when GM started doing the roll up, right? There were still 400 big ones, not, not, but, 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 but wait, that but, fate, but still to go from thousands where everyone is tinkering to yeah. 400 is huge. And then another 20 yeah. years to go to three. <laughs> Exactly. It's astounding. And you, and you know that people were making money at every stage of that, that cycle. And, but nobody would be, there was nobody making automobiles before the invention of the automobile. So that first, that phase is interesting. So you'd want to know, and I think to, to beat it to death, I think robotics are at the phase where we're going to go to the thousands of manufacturers and then consolidate down over time. But when it, the other step, the other stage is to know when something that was new, transistor, invented, obviously, 50s, became a business in the 60s, roughly, but really started to go in the 70s with Intel. Intel is, is a good flagship. We started to go when Intel was created. That's when we began to see a lot of growth. But a lot of people think that the transistor age is sort of peaking, that we're, we're at the beginning of the end of the growth, and it's sort of a mature industry. I think we're at the end of the beginning. I think that um, the growth phase for semis is, is, is now taking off that we're now, 
we've now consolidated. It's kind of like, again, I'm using automobile example because they're comparably big industries. But when the automobile industry started consolidating in Ford and General Motors were big in the 20s, this they were big companies then by any measure. But look at the growth from 1920s to to the for the next 80 years of the automobile right, sector right, for the world. Right, right. I think we're in 1920 for transistors and semiconductors, broadly okay, speaking. Let me stop you a second. Let me, let's use baseball terms. Where would <laughs> like you say? Baseball. Where would you say we are in the semiconductor industry at this point? First inning, fifth inning, eighth inning. Where do you think we are? Robots, first inning, semiconductors are in the fourth to fifth inning. Really, that late? You know, I, 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 was, I did a lot of research over the past year on semis. And uh, the more I find out about them, how we know we're going to the electrification of semiconductors. Uh, yeah, fourth, fifth, fair. I always seem to say like the second inning or so. It's not the first inning. First inning was about 20 years ago. So it, it's the way I see it. But uh, you please yeah. chime in. I, well, yeah, we have to define yeah, define our terms. First inning for me, the broader lot, timeline, 1970s with the first inning, uh, 20 years ago. And then that's so we're so, 50, okay, so you're saying 1970 was basically Intel, Gordon Moore, that whole rise right. there. I would even if go, you think of that. Would you go to 60s? That, would you say basically Fairchild at that point? Or, you know, that would be yeah, the, Fair, Fairchild, RCA. I worked for RCA in the semiconductor business. My first job was with designing and uh, processes for, fam, for semis, for, semi, for semiconductors and large scale integration. And it was a big industry then, but it was, these were, we were very much in the first innings. The invention stuff that went before is not first innings. That's, that's, those are inventions and tinkering. That's the thousand automobile makers got in the eight, eight, late, late 19th century. That's, that's batting practice. It, that's not even the, so the real game yet. Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in a different, sort of taking a different timelines than you. So if, if you accept my timeline, first innings are the 70s, Fairchild and, and, and TI, <clears throat> IBM, RCA, big companies. And if we, if you think in those terms, and we're now in the sort of the fourth or fourth, let's call it the fourth inning, 50 years later, there's a lot going to happen yet in the next 50 years, a lot. So I'm with you. We're, we're that's why I'm saying we're not, we're not anywhere near the, the ninth inning or uh, and we're not playing. We're playing early on, but we're growing from an incredibly big base. I mean, we're almost, we're already an industry if you count it in all of its forms and penumbra a trillion dollar industry and that's fourth inning come yeah, on this yeah. is this huge it's it's i just heard a conference call um i think it was lamb research i'm not sure i forgot i was listening to so many of them where they're talking about the uh the industry going from 500 billion to a trillion by 2030 right. so so yeah. g give me an industry on the other extreme you see we're saying robotics less here in the first give me another industry in the ninth inning in the ninth inning? Yes. Just so we could, we could, we could. Oh, uh, well, I guess that's, <laughs> if I were going to pick one, I, I think we're probably in the eighth or ninth inning of electric cars, even though I you know you like them and I like them too. The the amount of headroom the, uh, to expand the market share for electric vehicles. You know, I think of electric vehicles as a, a, an addition to the uh, model options that are available for personal vehicles. It's a great addition. Like it's like adding a diesel versus gasoline ver or a SUV versus a sports car. You get, you get a lot of there's a lot of options in how cars are made, but uh, the percentage of cars that can be electrified with technology as we know it is going to be pretty limited. Why is that? Well, it's materials that take stuff to make electric cars, and they, there's a profound and profoundly naive sense of. Uh, how how much we can expand the supply chain to build the electric cars. Right. I mean, I've been writing about this a lot and testify before the Senate and Congress on it many times over the years, not because it's my original research. I worked for a mining company in Canada in my another part of my peripatetic early youth. I, I love mines. I love mining. But you want to talk about a difficult industry to move quickly. It's mining. Uh, the average time to build and bring a mine online and the scale of minerals required. So here's the, the you know, it, from the UN to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and EU, in the last few years, all of them have decided to do studies that have gotten very little attention, asking the question of how many, how much, not just lithium, how much cobalt, nickel, common metals, copper, aluminum, the common stuff, as well as the exotic stuff, the rare earths, how much of that stuff will be needed to build 
oh, batteries, never mind solar panels and windmills. How much will you need to build them with the technology we have today? Because we're not we, we build with what we know. We can't build with what you think you might invent later. And everyone, including the IEA in a seminal study they did last year, which is an honest study, 300 pages of graphs and data, points out that the world is not mining today, nor planning to mine, even a fraction of the quantity of those minerals needed for the aspirations for these plans, not even a fraction. So we, we, we're short those minerals based on the current growth rate for EVs in a year or two. We know that's already happening because the mineral commodity prices are spiking, not because of the war in Ukraine and not because uh, mines have shut down anywhere. It's because the marginal demand, and as you know, in a commodity, if I increase the marginal demand a few percentage points above trend line, just a few percentage points, prices really go up a lot. Right. And we're talking about demand increases for common minerals from 500% to 7,000% over current production levels, global production levels. This, I'm, I'm just go out on a limb and say it, it won't happen because right. there's no, no one's building mines at that rate. It could happen eventually. Human beings are really good at building machines but there's a sort of a physics principle in building machines and mines and big infrastructures. It takes time, there's inertia to it. Right, you put a whole chapter in here, I think it's chapter 14, where the machines yeah. energize everything. You put a, a graph in here in terms of lead acid batteries, uh, nickel uh, metal hydride battery, lithium iron battery, fuel cells, and you see the ranges. But my question is, is Mark, is, is that's based on what materials we're using. I'm trying to think of an example, I just can't at the time, where everyone was thinking, A, yeah, the, the building of a transistor, right? Uh, to put X amount of data information on it, or the processing power <laughs> of a transistor was limited to the transistor until yeah. the semiconductor came along. You know, there was yeah. a sea change. So perhaps, and, I, and I'm with you, you're right, you're right, you just, you cannot produce enough of X if you don't have the components to make X. So even though everybody wants an ice cream cone, if you don't have enough ice cream cones, not everyone's going to get them. <laughs> No matter how. Uh, oh, put differently, if you don't have enough cows. So everybody wants an ice uh, cream cone. We right. decide we're all going to eat ice cream cones. And then you can work up the supply chain to the number of cows you need to make the milk. And if it, let's just happen to use that example. And what if you'd learned that policies mandating eating ice cream instead of wheat uh, were put in place by governments and incentives and, and subsidies were put in place for that. But you needed the, the number of cows in the world to increase by thousand percent. Yeah, but, but, then here, okay. but then here's the switch. Here's the switch. At some point, the marketplace will come up with, hey, how about coconut ice cream or made from sure. coconuts or almonds sure. or something? So sure. that's where I – tell me if I'm wrong on this one because you have yeah. a much better handle on this than I – way, way better. I, I hear everything you're saying about, the, about EVs. The limitations are going to be the materials that make the batteries, that make the, the, the end product with you. What about if someone comes out with a solid state battery or some X factor? Uh, doesn't that change everything? Well, um, sure. Yes, it does. But I'll, 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 I'll be, so I, <laughs> I'm an inveterate optimist. My book's very optimistic, as you know. But I'm also a realist. Yes, it changes everything, but the timeline matters. And what is, the, what is it that you changed? So I, I know the hot thing is to talk about solid state batteries. It's a new buzzword. It doesn't have any real fundamental meaning because it doesn't change the basic chemicals being used in the batteries. Or we shift the chemical soup around a bit. You can use less cobalt and use more nickel. You can use manganese instead of, you know, you can add silicon to the graphite anode. But, it, but the fundamental fact is, let, let's, let, me, let me divide it, if I can, real quickly into two buckets. One is the scale problem, no matter what the material is. The second problem you're, you're, you're correctly addressing is we'll just change the material. But hang on, hang on. Ex ex expand on a scale. Explain for my listeners, what do you mean by the scale problem? So we'll, we'll do scale first, and then we'll talk about the magic materials. That's why I have a whole chapter in my book on the energy materials nexus. I think most re re most analysis uh, fail to appreciate not only how important the material sciences are, but what a big deal is that what the big a big a deal of changes are. But back to scale, a single. You, I think you have a Tesla. I think I wrote, read you. So I like Teslas. I happen to like the fit and finish of the new Mercedes EV better. But, you know, Teslas are fine. They drive great. Um, Elon Musk deserves credit 
and his engineers for arguably designing probably the best lithium battery that's ever been designed in history. It's really quite a, an engineering feat. Uh, he really doesn't get enough credit for this. And I mean, he gets adulation, but the engineering credit is deserved. But here, here's the point. An, an EV like a Tesla has a thousand pound fuel tank, the battery. Okay, uh, that's replacing 100 pounds of gasoline. All right, first of all, you, you know, that's not nothing. The electric motors don't save you much weight compared to the weight of an internal combustion engine. They save you maybe 100 to 200 pounds. Electric motors are heavy. They're full of copper and they're made from aluminum and steel and they're heavy, as is the internal combustion engine. And they're pretty small and pretty light these days. So the main, the main trade going from exactly the same car, they all have wheels, they all have seats, all have glass. When you go from the car that's got a gasoline engine and 100, pound, 100 pounds of gasoline to electric vehicle, you have a thousand pound fuel tank. To make that thousand pound battery, you have to dig up for that one car about 500,000 pounds of material somewhere on earth. 500,000 pounds per car are dug up somewhere on earth because of the quantities of nickel, aluminum, manganese, cobalt. So, so, all so, the, all so the, let me interject for a second. For those who are listening who are totally... Um, absorbed with renewable energy and clean yeah. energy and green energy. Let's real talk time out. It's really not that clean or renewable as you <laughs> might think, because right. those things don't, don't come out of the sky and land in your land in your no. factory. They have to be mined. There is a whole, uh, a, yep. a carbon footprint <clears throat> that is, a, that is pretty large that we don't like to talk about. Well, it's more than pretty large. So the mining industry, <laughs> roughly speaking, is uh, uses more energy than the global aviation industry, first of all. Like aviation, it uses lots of oil because these big trucks are diesel powered. They use lots of coal and they use lots of natural gas. Um, you could talk about greening the mining sector, and they do, and I don't blame them. But that takes even longer than anything else because these are these big multi-million dollar mining machines are designed and built and operated each for decades I mean, they're running for 30 years. You don't, you don't replace them every three years. These are very big, expensive machines. So it's a long time before we stop using oil to do mining. And most of the mining isn't here. We don't like to mine in America anymore or Europe. So we export the environmental challenge. And it is a challenge to China, Africa, South America, uh, and all the, Asian the, countries. The way I look at it is not the challenge. I really look at it as a football. We don't want the football in our in our in our <laughs> in our uh, uh, backfield. So what do we do? We throw it somewhere and they say, look, it's not here. Well, I don't think what's happening over there is not having an impact here. You know, it's just silly. It is silly. So it's having lots of impacts. It's having environmental impacts, social impacts. The people who do mining in those countries are not as, I'll just say, as kind as many Western mining companies that mine here. Some of them are fine. I'm not besmirching all of them, but there's some pretty horrific practices in lots of parts of the world. And it's not like I'm the first one to point out, it was widely noted, we'll give credit to the New York Times and the Washington Post, did, did research a few years ago, found something like 20 to 30 percent of the labor in Congo mining cobalt children. Um, that's not so good. I mean, there, I mean, these are obvious things. But the scale problem, let's come back to scale. So what you'd want to know is to deliver a mile of driving or heat a ton of silicon or grow a pound of wheat, you want to know not just how much energy it takes, you want to know that, but you also want to know how many pounds of stuff I have to dig out of the earth to make the machines to deliver that unit of energy, that mile of driving. And in the energy world, in the car world, in the in electricity production world, in that, in that universe, it has been known for a long time that the consumption of physical materials to build machines to deliver the same unit of energy if you go wind and solar and batteries averages a thousand percent more than if you do hydrocarbons. Again, it depends on the exact material, but roughly that. So you have a thousand percent increase on physical material consumption to deliver the same end service to society um, that has consequences. Now, it may be that the materials are, are cheap. They have been cheap. As you increase a larger share of the, let's say driving. Right now, one, one in a hundred vehicles on the world's roads, less than that are electric vehicles under that. It's just say 0.8, but call it one in a hundred. So 1%. And world electricity and world energy, world energy broadly, about 3% of world energy comes from wind and solar. 
But these are very big numbers, but even though they're tiny percentages, a very big market. So that that was less than half that two years ago, because it's doubled for both of them. That marginal increase on that building those machines to do that at global levels, fed back up the supply chain to monstrous increases in demand for copper, nickel, aluminum, right? Lithium. Lithium prices are up about a thousand percent. Right. Which so the consequence of this first order, the scale, once you start building tens of millions of cars, each car has 200 pounds more copper than, than an internal combustion engine. Each car has 200 pounds more aluminum and you have than to an internal combustion engine. You have engine. to mine for that. You have to, uh, uh, environmental uh, damage. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, costs. And this, so the, Human, the question of, right, right. of scale comes to this point that I was trying to make with respect to my lack of conviction that it's a revolution on two counts. We aren't planning, nor is anybody doing anything about scaling the supply chain to make it possible. So it won't happen. It's not, forget the ask, it just won't happen because we're not doing it. So, so, so let me stop for a second. Going back to our uh, uh, ice cream example, yeah. we just don't have enough. Even if everybody wants an ice cream cone, we just are not at the point where if everyone did want ice cream, we have enough cows, we have enough grass, we have enough feed, we have enough, we don't have exactly. enough of that to produce the end result. So if everybody keeps wanting those ice cream cones, what happens is the price of the milk goes up and the price of the cow goes up because the, the way commodities work is that the last guy in that wants it, really wants it, he bids up the price to get it. So because the, the guy behind doesn't pay that price, that creates the vicious cycle of inflation of commodities, which is what's we're seeing going now. on. We're seeing now. Yes. You know, so the and the scale the scale problems are really uh, clear when you read the reports that have been written by lots of environmental agencies themselves in the UN. W world isn't producing them, and if they if the world tries to produce it, we have the problems you've described in the environment. We have geopolitical issues. We create shifts in supply chains. Not that none of it could ever happen. It just won't happen. The time frames needed. It takes. Typically, in the IEA report, they pointed out it takes an average of 16 years to build a new mine from scratch to being operating, average of 16. If you assume the world decides I need them faster, call it 10 years, really cut it down. In America, it's 30 years, 20 to 30 years. But assume if you, if you politicians decide yeah. they want to do it. <laughs> right, right. 10 years. Yeah. It's 10 years. So for 10 years, everybody wants their ice cream cone, but it's going to take 10 years before there's enough cows to make the milk. In the meantime, everybody's bidding it up. It won't, it just, it won't end well because people will say, well, you know what, to your point, uh, maybe I don't want ice cream. I'll go back to uh, bananas. So the scale problems are, are really staggering when you look at changing the world's energy systems. We are going to have more EVs. There's going to be more windmills, but it's not going to eliminate hydrocarbons and transition us to some nirvana. It, it will require the same stuff that mining does. Uh, sorry, drilling does. You have to dig stuff out of the ground, build machines made out of steel and aluminum, have ships and trains and trucks and deliver stuff, and they convert it, as you pointed, refineries that use chemicals. I mean, to make a battery, think about the supply chain. You, you've got to to get the copper or the or the manganese or the nickel. You've got to not only dig up rocks, you got to crush the rocks. It takes a lot of energy and dissolve them. Think about that. I mean, you got to dissolve rock somehow, which is chemicals, which take energy have environmental challenges, and then use chemical processes to extract the and refine the pure elements, the copper, whatever it is. So that the scale stuff is what will make these aspirations not happen, not because people want them to happen or don't want them to happen. It doesn't, it it's not a political opposition. Right. It's, it's reality. Naive. It's just, it's just, it's what just it, reality. What okay, so let me ask yeah. you this question, Mark. <clears throat> uh, Tesla, I think uh, um, uh, Musk mentioned uh, the problems, uh, brought this to everyone's attention. But yeah. uh, General Motors, Ford, uh, they, they, we're just at the cusp from the consumer side of coming out with more models than you could shake a stick at. Every oh, company yeah. has a model coming out. My question yeah. to you, based on this background or really the context that you just gave, you know, be careful for what you wish for, right? So let's assume <laughs> we do all have, you know, the, every company comes out. And I think it was something where I saw that if you, if you put Tesla up, in the list of uh, cars sold in the United States, uh, compared to ICE uh, internal combustion engines, I think it would be number eleven or seventeen, somewhere yeah, around. Sounds there. about right. So you yeah. have the F-150, you have all these other yeah. cars which are oh, extremely much popular. Yeah, yeah, everyone loves them. Okay, 
Ford comes out with their new F-150. Everybody wants that car. Yeah. Everybody wants ice cream cones. Now, yeah. now walk with me. G- give me level two and level three thinking. What do you see happening a year or so from now when, because I know what's happening now with the car industry now with used cars and regular, just from the semiconductor yeah. problem. But here we're talking about everybody wanting to be green. And we have an administration in Washington, which the, the, it, it declared war on fossil fuel. And this folks <laughs> has nothing, and I don't want to get any emails, nothing to do with me being a Democrat or Republican. It just exactly. is. You have an administration which said they're going to war on fossil fuel, and everything they've done has pointed in that direction. The same way yeah. the Trump administration was the opposite. It was drill, baby, drill. So <clears> it's, <throat> it's not a political thing. It just happens to be what the administration is doing now and not forcing, but really is, is telling you where things are going to be going. So yeah. in that big, large question that I just, I'm formulating, <laughs> I didn't even ask it yet. <laughs> what happens when all this, to borrow one of your words, all of this converges? You have the consumerism, yeah. you have the push for renewables, you have the EVs, <laughs> and I didn't even talk about yet, I didn't even talk about yet, which threw into the picture, is the shortage of fossil fuel, which drives a lot of these things. Yeah, What do I know. you see happening? Well... That's, that's a big one. Um, and then we, have to come, then we have to come back to your other question, but I'll answer that. Um, I'll give you the short answer and then the, then the explanation of why I think it, what's going to happen. It's going to happen. But I want to come back to your other question. It's really important. I get it all the time. Once you tell people there's limits to what you can do with lithium batteries, they say, well, well, we'll just invent a different material, better battery. And we will. But let's come back to that uh, because uh, I, I think that's really important to understand, too. So what's... So I think you articulated it exactly right. Um, we l- forget why the politicians do what they do, and and it's really kind of sad that we've politicized energy, energy issues. I know <laughs> yeah, they have been, but they are. And, and we, so we've we, sort we, of we politicized energy. We we politicized climate. We politicized virtually everything. everything. So I put know. that aside. And it, you know, it's a great line the British Prime Minister made years ago after a disastrous coal mine. Um, uh, you know, a collapse. And um, he was recorded as, I forget which prime minister, it's embarrassing. Anyway, he, he, he started thinking about the political fallout from, from that coal mine disaster in Wales and his, his chiefs and he's, his chief of staff said, but these children have died. How can you talk about politics at a time like this? And he famously looked at her in a British accent, which I won't, which I won't attempt mm-hmm. to imitate, even though my father was British. He said, my dear, everything is political. Everything is political. We live in a political world. I get it. So I'm not I'm not be- be- bemoaning that, except we still have to deal with facts. So here here's what's going on. You're absolutely right. We have policies, not just uh, this administration, policies largely for decades in America have been somewhat hostile, ranging ranging from mildly hostile to very hostile to hydrocarbon production. So we it's not like we have drill baby drill presidents <laughs> really. We have, they are they're just mild they're just less hostile because the regulations are pretty tough it's not been the the american uh experiment with energy has not been equivalent to the saudis or uh guiana where they're thrilled when, you, when they find an oil they just <laughs> they say drill baby drill so this is stipulate that but you're right what we have in place are epic uh oppositions both economically and politically by economically i mean in the investment world where the pressure to not invest overtly and implicitly in oil and gas is enormous. So that's that's had an effect. We've reduced discoveries and drilling and exploration, and the world still gets 84% of all of its energy from hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal, and oil use is returning to its pre-lockdown levels, but supply is not growing at the same rate. That means prices go up and they'll keep going up as long as that formula stays in place. Okay, so, so let, we just, have, let me just so, summarize this in one sentence, what you basically said for those keeping a careful eye, because Mark gives you way more detail than I do, uh, <laughs> and, and, and great stuff. You have limited supply and increasing yep. demand. What happens? Yep. Price goes up. Price That's goes why up. we're paying more money for oil. And, so and let's t- that's, it's a perfect storm. The pr- proverbial perfect storm is three things intersect that simultaneously to make a bigger wave. That's what the movie was about. But it's actually in physics, that's how it works. You get you get th- intersection of three 
coincident things. The, so the second thing is, as you know, is the higher price of oil and gas raises the cost of making the machines, operating the machines, shipping the stuff. Everybody knows that. So diesel fuel is more expensive. So everything you ship from wheat to your computers is more expensive. So that's a, a secondary, if you like, a uh, derivative inflationary effect, including making electric vehicles because the oil is more expensive to mine the lithium. So you make the lithium more expensive. Right. At the same time, the, th the third, a triple whammy is that I've artificially increased the demand for ice cream or lithium batteries. I tell everybody they have to use one or I'll subsidize you if you buy one. So the, in that case, that supply can't keep up with demand because no one is subsidizing the mining. Nobody is saying, I want to give, give away money to mine more nickel in America. In fact, we're doing the opposite. We're, we're giving you more money to buy a car, the end, the end product, Correct. which without, exactly. with being totally, uh, I don't know, I would say, or head in the sand, realizing that there's a whole chain <clears throat> behind it that gets you that. It's like, you know, watching how the sausage is made. Nobody wants to see how the sausage is made. They just want their frankfurter. No, sure. I don't, you a know, lot of stuff I, goes listen, in there and nobody wants to look well, at it. And one of the miracles of modern society is that I don't have to care about how sausages are made. They get made inexpensively, safely, reliably, and delivered to me until that stops. And it stops when people do naive and silly things. This is what we're doing now. So, But the, the answer to your question, in short, is that we have set in place epic forces for inflation, uh, maybe significantly different than anything in recent history. That are, which I think the Fed's going to have a hard time fighting. You know, the Fed's trying to fight inflation, as you know, by slowing the creation of money, which is inflationary, and raising interest rates to slow demand by slowing economic growth. So that's a, sort of the blunt tool. But at the meantime, other government policies are di directly, unintentionally, I'll, I'll assume, but directly fueling inflation by decreasing supply of critical things or increasing demand for things for which there's not enough supply. Those, So the net effect is we're going to be in an inflationary period, which is politically incendiary. Consumers are going to be very unhappy. Everything's more expensive now. Everything's going to get more expensive. Green machines are more expensive. Elon Musk and BYD, BYD is the biggest EV maker in China, both announced price increases for the cars entirely because of commodity price right. increases, mostly lithium right now but the others are going up. We, in fact, Elon Musk even announced a price increase for space launches on SpaceX because of commodity price increases. So if you want to have a sense that everything's getting more expensive You're because right. of these yeah. bad policies from space shots, which, you know, who cares, right? Well, people care. People who launch satellites that, that do environmental monitoring had cheap launches, the launches are getting more expensive. You know that's the, that's a, 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 a not a good not a good thing politically. It's not good for the economy. I don't think consumers will like it. I don't think they'll tolerate it. Um, I don't know how it'll play out politically. I mean, I have opinions on that, but it's a practical matter. It means that in the sh in the short term, any technology, any company, any software, any piece of automation that can add efficiency, that can that can dampen the effects of inflation on what I'm doing with the inflated good, the inflated energy cost will be a good play if I'm an investor, because you're going to have to live with uh, $4 or $5 or higher diesel fuel or gasoline. You want to have a more efficient machine. If you want to put up with the chemicals going in, the batteries being more expensive, you're going to have to find a way to get cheaper chemical, chemical processing. These are all very uh, challenging industrial processes, but they are amenable to efficiency improvements. And tiny improvements, when prices are high, are a really big deal. So there's a lot of businesses, I think, that will benefit from that in, in, during that cycle. And a cycle will break. And, I mean, all these cycles, they're called cycles for a reason. <laughs> it'll, it'll break. We'll either have a recession, a big recession, which kills the band and prices go down. Or we'll have a political revolution where, where the electorate will say, please do something to increase supply. What, what will it take to increase supply? Or, or stop offering incentives to increase demand. Well, stop that. Just yeah. stop the nonsense, right. so, so, which know, is in, stop. In, in my house, we have a den. The den and the kitchen are on the same th heat thermostat. So when <laughs> someone sitting in the den gets hot, instead of turning down the <laughs> thermostat, we open up the French doors. So you have 40 mile an hour winds coming in, yeah. <laughs> increasing the heat while yeah. they're trying to get cold. And I said, sure. do you guys realize what you're doing? <laughs> you know, this is <laughs> this is not stopping. Just get up and lower it. You, you can't have two forces working yeah. against each other. 
And and I and I think you know one of the things that I, I didn't like from day one, I didn't quite know the uh, the impact and the ramifications the way you do when you spell it out really beautifully, is when they had the government incentives for EVs. My first question was, this doesn't end well. It, yeah. it never ends well when you when you're cycling up demand <clears throat> yeah. based on a political ideology of I want to be all green. Anything green is going to work. Solar, this. It didn't make economic sense. And eventually you have to pay the piper. That's yeah. the, just the way I saw it. I didn't, I did, definitely didn't do fourth level thinking like you just did and, and laid it out there with the cost and this. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, and, 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 and kudos for, for, for really setting the table on that. But when the government starts, and I don't care what administration, Democrat or Republican, when you start to churn that, turn that dial and you want things to be made quicker, <clears> realize <throat> that there are repercussions way down the supply chain that you'll have intended and most, most importantly, most deadly are the unintended consequence. Yeah. And you never know where they're going to kick you in the ass. But you're absolutely right. And so your instincts are correct. And then it, it typically, in fact, when I wrote my book, I mean, what I typically do on your research is you have an instinct about something. One has an instinct. Then you go looking for the numbers and the facts, trying to get a sense of was the instinct right? And if it was wrong, why was I wrong? And if I'm right, what are the data to support that you're right? In this case, I think we will we will see something, I guess what I would call peak subsidies. You can't, you can't just keep doing round trips. I mean, a good example of a silly subsidy your, to your open window and thermostat is, you know, Governor Newsom, not to be political, but he did something rather silly. And they've done this in European countries, so he's not alone. Uh, gasoline prices go up, right? So what does he do? He wants to write checks to people. Well, that introduces a new bureaucracy. You have to collect the money some other way. Why not just cut the gasoline tax? That happens inst instantly. Cost costs nothing in terms of the overhead. It, a stroke of a pen uh, it can suspend the gasoline taxes, let's just say temporarily, entirely, because California has the highest gasoline taxes. Uh, if you wanted, you could micromanage it, suspend it for people below a certain income or whatever. But the point is, he he chose the equivalent of turning the heat up while he opened the window. It'll just stimulate gasoline demand in the state of California because you're paying people, you're already sending them a check to buy gasoline. What are they going to do with the check? They'll buy gasoline. But look, the I think the um, to come back to your, your question about where we're heading, the reason I, I'm, I'm really, you might guess, you probably would, I'm a little worried about what we're doing politically and economically to the Western world. India and China are not doing this themselves, but we are, in terms of inflation and damage to our economy. Uh, and the only way to turn the ship is political. It's going to be political. We have to decide we can't do it this, this way. It doesn't mean that people who think, we can make fundamental changes in technology to do something like your earlier question. Couldn't we, if this battery solution is not the right one, we don't have the materials, how about a new technology? Wouldn't somebody just invent something different or better? So is that possible? Sure it is. Uh, then what's the timelines, which we can talk about, but there's no question there's always new inventions. The key with economies is back to where we started is how long does it take to go from the invention to a practical product to commercially scaling it and when i did my book i did some research on this because i had this instinct like you had, i'm driven a lot by instincts i'm a physicist not an engineer so that's the typical back of the envelope you sort of think about something this seems right but then you gotta figure out is it really right it takes there's a sort of a a 2020 20 rule in big systems. That is, it takes 20 years from the invention of a technology, discovery of something, before you're making something that's quasi commercially useful. Well, 20 years. And then it's about 20 years before it starts to significantly impact markets and, and you know, have a product that scales. I mean, the lithium chemistry was invented, by the way, by an Exxon chemist in the 1970s. 70s, Exxon, which is kind of ironic. It's too bad they didn't stay in that business, right? It's like, you know, anyway, it's like, like Eastman Kodak creating the digital uh, camera, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was 20 do. years before the lithium battery began to enter markets in the 90s. Uh, and it was expensive, but it's what made cell phones possible and laptops. And it was almost another 20 years before they were cheap enough and good enough, scaled enough, that the first sedan, Tesla sedan showed up, the revolutionary change in uh, a fuel for lots of cars. But that's 20, 20, 20. If you look at all kinds of technologies. The idea that we're accelerating that pace isn't really true. 
for big things that really change society. And it's annoying to people for easy things like changing fashion, uh, you know, changing the fashion of clothing or changing an app on a phone has a high velocity, but the other stuff just doesn't. You know, just on, just on a point, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't BYD start out as a battery maker in China? Wasn't that... Uh... <laughs> no, BYD was a military contractor. <laughs> so the B- BYD uh, uh, was the, Buffett, the company that Buffett invested in. Yeah. They were military contractor first? Mm-hmm. And they still are. They still supply. They're, they're the uh, principal supplier, at least they were some years ago, of, of batteries and battery technology to the uh, Chinese Navy and the Chinese military. But they started yeah. out in the battery business. Yeah. That was the whole thing, was uh, with yeah. Munger and uh, Li Lu. Uh, it took so, a great company. They started a battery business. They went into the car business because they said, "What well, if the battery is the single most expensive part of the car? <clears throat> why would I sell that? And in effect, Elon Musk did not invent a car, as you know. The, that's why it was emphasizing and, the point. And, and he didn't start Tesla. <laughs> it, well, exactly. Yeah. And what he, but what, what he did is he had the brilliance to make sure the engineers around him engineered the battery because the battery is the, is the key. But, you know, I, look, I'm, I'm, I think we're on a, a bad track. Uh, briefly, we're going to go through another inflationary cycle, and and it will trigger a recession. How much of a recession possible? No, because governments have the capacity to make them worse by doing stupid things, and maybe we'll get lucky. But I think one thing that's different, and I would say, uh, are a recovery from a recession this time. We may already be in recession, frankly. I think when the March numbers come out, we'll probably see we're pretty close to zero percent growth. When you look at the Freight index, you know, this is a leading edge indicator, as you probably know. It fell off a cliff in the middle of March and went down, which is the goods being shipped around. So people, people were feeling the, the heat from the inflation and buying less stuff, and they sort of gone through the lockdown burst of, you know, buying lumber and doing additions. And yeah, anyway, let me hold, hold one second. Is the freight index Mark is referring to is the cost to move goods. Uh, by ship uh, containers from one end of the earth to the other. That was originally two to three thousand dollars a container. Then it went up to as high, I think, it was twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah. And now it's receded. Not that things have gotten better, but demand has started to fall off. That's exactly. A, yeah. yeah. And the truck index is the same in America. The number of, of, of uh, you know, ton miles of, of goods carried around the country and, and delivered the same, to homes. So the same is, thing with railroads. It's, it's all same thing. That all there. So that tells you that's a sort of a leading indicator that. It's cooling down and it's cooling down before the Fed raised rates, right? So it was already cooling down. It cooled down because of inflation, things that were getting more expensive, but also I think it's a behavioral cool down on the recovery. So we're going to go into another phase. And I think the phase we're going to go into is um, growth in the service side. People go back to flying and vacations as they get calmer about the evil COVIDs. And, and that will have a shift in sort of investment implications. But I think the the principal difference over the next few years, and we're, we're we're locked into the inflationary cycle now. It's hard to get out of it. Even if governments tomorrow said, you know, oops, my bad, I won't, I'm not going to give away money to buy electric cars anymore. If you like one and you're wealthy, why should I give you fifteen thousand dollars to buy a ninety thousand dollar car? I should give you nothing. You should you should be anyway. Even if they reverse that, it's slow. But the technologies of uh, the industrial sector, which is where, as you know, I spent a lot time of my book, the the migration of computing in the cloud, in, in the internet of things, the artificial intelligence, the, the, the whole ecosystem of doing industrial things, not doing informational things, not news, TV, 3D, entertainment, 3D printing, finance. 3D printing, that's, manufacturing. Right, that's 20% of our GDP. Right, so you're talking about 3D printing, uh, manufacturing. Everything, well, not just e- even, how about just even something as simple as have it, you're, let's say you're a business and you'd like to have real-time visibility when you order something to sell in your store on where it's being manufactured, when it's going to get to you, what's delaying it. I mean, the whole supply chain, you'd like to have that as, as, as visible as a Google map. Your whole logistics, your whole logistics chain. That would be, that would be a beautiful thing and very economically powerful and anti-inflationary. That's, that's in theory been possible for a decade or two. It's only now becoming possible that emergence of that kind of thing, plus things like 3D printing, things like what I write about in my book, computational materials, to your other question about changing, if one material doesn't work so well, it's too expensive, let's engineer a new material. Those things are now what's emerging as possible, no longer crazy. They're at the 
1905 stage of the automobile, so to speak. And, and that's anti-inflationary, profoundly anti-inflationary, and will help, help dampen the inflation we're going to face and help get us out of the inflationary mess that our government's created. You know, you know I found something really insightful uh, in your chapter on the servicic, servification of manufacturing. Uh, was it here or there, somewhere else? I'm sorry. You talk about- Servi Servicification of manufacturing? Of manufacturing. You put, no, <laughs> A mouthful? Was, yeah, there was something else. Maybe I didn't see it here. Oh, here it is. How big the manufacturing sector really is and how the divisions, uh, here it is, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think it was 20% or something. The way it's, the way the government throws them all into one, into one category and stuff. Uh, you make the case that uh, as, uh, the manufacturing sector is way bigger uh, you hear a lot about service in this, but your your point, I forget where I saw that. I'm sorry. It's, uh, well, know, it's, this is, this is, this is, you know, I'm glad you, 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 you pointed that out because I think this, this is a category of what I try to spend a lot of time in my book on is framing what it is we think we know. So in order to understand what's going to happen, right? So the government has three sectors, manufacturing services and, and agriculture, right? F food services and manufacturing, mm -hmm. which, kind of nice and convenient, except my point I was making is that a service like flying an airplane, issuing you a driver's license, operating in a hospital or a restaurant are really different industries. I mean, yeah, we can call them also, but they're, they're far different from each other than manufacturing cars and manufacturing robots or manufacturing chairs. There's much more similarity amongst the manufacturing industries than this, this amorphous over large bucket it's, it, it would be the equivalent of calling, of, of, of forgetting that there's a difference between a cow and a human and just saying that they're all animals. Mammals. That's true. Well, it take all mammals, but, right? Uh, you, well, you, you it's the true, point, but it's, 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 it's a useless uh, taxonomy. It's, it's like and manufacturing put, is the biggest sector of the U.S. economy right, you when put, you divide it up properly. You put it in here, I think it was, um, I can't find it now, but um, Apple, 85% of Apple is hardware. And uh, if you told me that Apple's yeah. a hardware company, the average person yep. said, you got to be crazy. It's a technology, disruptive, uh, software, or service. It's, no. bottom line, they sell, they sell things. They, sell, they, not only, they not only sell hardware, they're, they're brilliant at managing the manufacturing ecosystem. In fact, Apple, to me, epitomizes the thesis of my book, if you think about it in these terms. Everybody wants to talk about tech, and by that they mean software and silicon. Okay, fair enough. But technology is making everything. That's what technology is definitionally. And we're infusing silicon and software into all the products, like a phone is obviously by definition infused with silicon software, but it's not just that. It has a battery, which is a chemical engine. It has a display, which is a light engine. I mean, these are different things in computing, right? But what Apple has done is brought the brilliance of using software in their business to manage their business in a way to produce a product, a hardware, a phone, a earbud, whatever it is, in, in manners which other businesses are beginning to do and understand. So if everybody begins to manage their enterprise like Apple, or whatever their enterprises, but especially hardware enterprises, then you get these remarkable uh, efficiencies, and, but you're still manufacturing a product. I mean, hardware, Google, Google is more of a software company than Apple, although they have an awful lot of hardware businesses in their, in their umbrella now under the Alphabet label. And they like Amazon, and let's, let's use Amazon. Amazon it doesn't sell, they retail a lot of hardware for other people. So that, that's, that's a hardware business. But more importantly, Amazon Cloud, as I point out in my early chapters of my book, is a physical infrastructure, the scale of which the world has never built and the biggest builder the, the big the big kahuna is Amazon and it's a hardware business. They're building data centers that you know millions of Google feet. engineers call warehouse scale computers. They're the size yeah. of shopping malls, yeah. goodness sake. And they're building them by the millions of square feet. And it's filled with you know billions of trillions of transistors that are hardware built in other factories. I mean, talk about a hardware centric world. The thing is, when you hear cloud, right, you're thinking it's a, it's a great name, cloud. It's not really a cloud. It's it's based on Earth somewhere in a huge, huge, huge physical space Yeah, that requires hardware. It, and 
but it's the fu- what's exciting is we're now seeing this fusion of software and hardware, the fusion of logic and you know bits and atoms that you know uh, you hear Peter Thiel talk about, and it's a, it's a good phrase. But the, everything about the world is that human beings are a fusion of if you like bits and atoms. We're biological machines with something we don't understand. We don't understand how our software works, even though people pretend they do, but they they really don't. We're a long way away from understanding creativity and and motion and logic. Uh, we're getting better at it. We're, I think we're we're sort of at the a stone age in that. But we're we're but most of the machinery that we build is dumb, right? It, it, making smart machines is really really hard. And we've talked about smart machines for a long long time. But most machinery we manage it with smart things, but it's not the machine itself can't react, right? It can't. And, and most machines can't, and they can't react dynamically. That is, they can react to one specific thing, like a switch. And as we start to create machines that have, a, what we'll call awareness of the physical environment and react and adapt to it. This is not a robot. This is just, I mean, the smart materials that can self heal when, a, when they start to fracture and break. In, in emulating what biology does, this is not crazy anymore. This is the kind of materials that are already being engineered and developed on the cusp of being made into commercial products. So as you sort of look at this landscape of things and you think about what, what's really going on in the subterranean part of innovation, not the superficial part when people talk about a new invention, I mean, a new product. It's, it, I mean, I was, I, I was sort of an optimist when I started writing the book, I became more excited and optimistic when I finished writing it. But I ended, as you know, with an epilogue about, you know, what can go wrong. A lot can go wrong wrong. still. I mean, we, we, you know, government, politics matters. I I mean, I framed the book at the beginning and the end pointing out politics matters. You can't, you can't avoid governments uh, screwing things up. And and you can, as you can Sovietize an economy, literally, Russia did that for 80 years and they lagged the world in growth, sadly. Uh, I, I, I worry about those things, but I'm at the same time, kind of optimistic that the American um, the zeitgeist in the United States is profoundly different than many other nations. And well, well, I, you well, know, I'm a Canadian, I immigrated here. It's, it's, there are cultural differences that no culture is perfect. I'm not doing sort of relativism here. I'm just talking about a feature of the American culture, which was the reason I came here. And I think it's still here, which is a combination of risk-taking dynamism and tolerance, and the tolerance part is that one I think is underrated. People will tolerate government mis- mistakes, doing stupid things for a long time, because you know I don't know maybe this is a good idea. You know, it means I'm being mildly facetious until they find out it's not really a good idea, and then you vote the bombs out and you try something else. I think that's a far better way to manage getting to the future than having believing that somebody is brilliant enough to direct what the future will look like. You know, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting point you brought up is why, as Americans, do we have more tolerance for experimentation, failure, uh, innovation, uh, causing disruption as a, a nonconformity as opposed to other yeah. cultures? I guess because we're a melting pot. You know, it's a it's a uh, it's it's a it's 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 peoples from all over the world uh, uh, that that are like-minded that like you came here for that reason. Yeah. And it, it, it kinds of, it kind of builds upon itself. I, I, I think, I think you're right. I think it is. I mean, it, it's a melting pot and that's, you know, I'm an immigrant, so I'm biased. I'm pro immigration. I think Im- immigrants are great. I think we should have lots of them happen to think we should have a process and a, and a border to manage how they come. But I'm, I'm a huge bull uh, for the benefits to America. Mm-hmm. Just think about it. If you, want so leaving your own homeland is really tough it really is and if if you really want to go somewhere and make something out of your life that that's the kind of entrepreneurial energy you know uh zeitgeist we want in america this is great i'm setting aside the obvious thing of refugees that's a a special case but anyway the question of why we're like that was what um edmund phelps who i quoted my book he was a nobel nobelist in economics he wrote a book uh, a few years ago called Mass Flourishing. And he wrote the book to explore the question that you just you know, picked up on is why did America uniquely benefit from the, the technological, the fruits of technology of the last century? Because 
technology has this tragedy, the commons feature, right? You, you can patent stuff, but once you've invented it, other people can steal it, use it, borrow it, do it, and do. Uh, or you can license it to them if, you, if you're lucky. You get. So why did the United States uniquely benefit? Because it did over the last century, or the, to call it the 20th century. And it's a it's a deep book. It's a it's much denser than my book, but it's a really good book. Highly recommend it for those who want to sort of plumb that question. The essence of the con conclusion he reaches is it's in that inelocutable feature of the American spirit, which comes from its history, from its melting pot, from its frontiers, from its geography, from all. The, he sort of gets to this unsatisfactory answer in some senses, but also for me, a very satisfactory answer, that it's the nature of this country, which is sort of why we have these arguments, which are good arguments to have about what is the nature of this country? Because it's, I think that, you know, I'm a tech bull, but the reason I think I'm bullish about America being the ascendant economic uh, nation of the 21st century is because of two things, Amer the technology changes that are underway now are as great as anything that happened 100 years ago, and they're all happening now, and they're happening mainly in America, which is great because you, you know we'll benefit from them, but we, we tend to be pretty good at spreading them around the world. That's why China does what they do; they borrow, well, we stole. Pretty, pretty good, I'd say. You know, I'd say you yeah. say that tongue in cheek. I say we're outstanding. We're excellent in spreading our culture yeah. and our inventions and our technologies <laughs> to uh, everybody. And you know, there's one thing that I just want to just want to just add on to that, and um, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Is that um, uh, the the I think I saw this. I forgot where I saw this. Fifty percent, or about fifty percent, of Fortune 500 CEO Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants, and at least fifty percent of the CEOs are the children or themselves immigrants. Now. It, that's unsurprising, and, I, and I'll add another one on the innovation side. If you looked, I, I did a spelunking of the Nobel Prizes because it is a sort of the bellwether for innovation at the pinnacle of science, let's just say. And if you look at Nobel Prizes, vast majority have been awarded to American citizens. However, the last I checked, uh, the majority, so at least uh, half or slightly more, were either immigrants who became Americans or, or direct sons or daughters of an immigrant, that it's a huge uh, that brain drain to America, uh, uh, to the, I guess, chagrin of some other countries, continues. But why do, why do people who become Nobel laureates want to come here? Well, I think it's because you could say it's for the money, because they're a wealthy economy. I'm sure there's some of that, but it's mostly because they can work in an environment that I think is fundamentally optimistic and fundamentally risk taking and a lot of the social problems we have come from that i mean i'm i'm, I'm not going to go deep into psychiatry i had a brief digression in my book on, from marshall McLuhan's and the medium and the meshes because he's a canadian but the, the psychiatry of of risk taking also gets you some of our problems if you think about it it's, it's our social problems come from tolerance for risk taking right yeah, and, and a lot of the solutions uh, to those yeah. problems are also uh kind of so, yeah, yeah um, uh, Mark, I could speak to you. We have to have you on again. Uh, this is great. Next, uh, uh, you have some really great stuff here. We didn't even touch many of the things. I want to talk about what you're looking at now, uh, what, industry, what, um, what, um, what technologies. Uh, I know robotics is one big one, but you have so many other points. We'll, we'll definitely have you on again. So, folks, the name of the book is The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it and, and continued success. Well, thank you. I pre really appreciate it. It's uh, fun talking to you. I'd love to come back and we could talk about augmented and virtual reality and the future of entertainment and education. Outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> thanks. You too. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, We'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.